instance, like, you know, being able to do, uh, you know, a canary deploy, right, where you have the ability to do a small section of those that you're going to deploy to where you're testing, and then you, you uh, validate that before you roll it out larger. You know, there's blue, green, there's a bunch of different ones. That's all covered in the DevOps handbook. Now, if we look at the Unicorn Project, that's the most recent book. I think it came out in, you know, in 2020. Um, but that particular book was focused on digital disruption. And as we all know, the biggest digital disruption that we could ever have faced uh, was, was the pandemic, right? So everybody had to rethink how we were uh, working how, you know, access to different applications, I mean, everything changed for us. So the digital disruption that it's talking about in the Unicorn Project is certainly something that's relevant. Um, but these books, again, I highly recommend you read them. Uh, they're just really, really good when it comes to understanding the topic. Now, what does it take to embrace DevOps? This is an example of an acronym that you'll often see referenced uh, as, as a way to be able to understand what DevOps is. So you hear it re referred to as the CAMS uh, model. So what CAMS does is it will give you the ability to be able to see the core principles that are required to be able to be successful. And as, the, as I mentioned before, the first one is culture. You have to have an agile and lean operating model. These are really essential to be able to understand how you need to operate in a DevOps world because it is based on agile, it's based on rapid change and being able to adapt to change. But the key thing here is it has to be business driven. This will not be something that will work if you only do it in a pocket of your business. So say, for example, the dev team decides, you know what, we're going all in with this DevOps thing, but the ops team's like, you know, not really. You just give us the applications. We're going to use our existing processes. That will never work. So you need to have uh, the ability within the business to define what your strategy is and your goal and to be able to make sure that the environment is set up and the, the culture is set up to be able to uh, uh, embrace these new capabilities. Uh, because that is typically where I see the most challenge with organizations is just they're halfway in and that just does not work often. So as you start to look at some of the other capabilities, the automation piece, now this is where the techies always get excited because yes, there's a ton of technology and automation capabilities in DevOps. So in order to be able to do this stuff and do it at speed, we have to automate. So the goal is to improve speed and frequency of deployments, as well as to make sure that the deployments that we do are done in a much more cost-effective and a faster way. And the other goal is to reduce effort. One of the best metrics that you can use in your business is, what did I simplify? Simplification is the ultimate form of sophistication. I don't know who said that, but it's a wonderful quote. And if you think about what we're trying to do with DevOps, we're trying to get all of the weight out of our processes so that we can move faster and we can put the, the, the you know, maximum effort into building uh, value for our customers and our business. Now, the next thing would be measurement. And this is an, another essential part of DevOps is we have to continually gather analytics. Now, analytics are something that you can get a ton of data. And one of the, the, the best pieces of advice I can give you from data is, you know, from a data perspective, perspective is if you're not going to use the data, don't collect it right? Because it just creates a bunch of noise. So having a measured, defined way in which you're going to uh, look at success and failure within applications and the meantime between deployments, you know, the time between errors and resolution, all those things are crucial. Being able to understand how the machine is operating are the gauges you use to run this environment. So gathering the analytics and then visualizing them and turning them into, into information. That's the key thing because data on itself is just data. In fact, it'll create more data. And then ultimately you get into this uh, uh, snowball of data, okay? So anything that you collect, make sure you're analyzing it and you're visualizing it. And that's, that will allow you to be able to leverage this component. And the last but not least is the sharing aspect of it. So within DevOps, one of the key things you have to do is you have to create a shared fate environment for the different parts of the business that are part of this. So I mentioned before the dev and the ops team, if they don't have a shared fate environment where success only occurs when the application is deployed successfully, then you enter, end up running into these things, well, you know, where people are, you know, or, or organizations are pitching things over the fence between uh, their, their different groups, and they don't have a consistent strategy. So having a shared fate environment where everyone sinks or swims together is ultimately the, the best path to success for DevOps. So these are some, some high-level topics, but I think it's important to understand these because 
this will be your uh, guide to helping understand how you can implement these these uh, capabilities within your organization because it really starts here. It starts with these uh, primary capabilities within your business as well as making sure that your business has the appetite to do and to go on this journey with you. Okay? All right, so now let's talk a little bit about the three uh, ways of DevOps. So this comes directly from the Phoenix Project, and it's a great way to understand the core operational principles that you need to put into place in order to be successful with DevOps. So the first thing is to be able to focus on systems and flow. Now, systems and flow are designed to be able to think about where it came from, uh, you know, sort of a manufacturing pro uh, process. You'll understand that, you know what, any bottleneck that happens in the manufacturing process can have ripple effects. So the goal of systems and flow is to make work visible. I need to see what different uh, work streams are happening so I can optimize them and make sure that there aren't constraints or there aren't back backlogs of things that need to be done. The other thing is to be able to reduce batch sizes of work. Now, if you've ever been on a highway and you've been driving along and then you see a bunch of brake lights, what is a fully utilized highway? Well, obviously, it's a parking lot. No one's going anywhere. So the goal there is to be able to reduce the flow of cars going onto the highway. And a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, municipalities and, and, and uh, you know, roadworks environments have created metering systems where you'll have like a light that will only allow certain cars on at a particular uh, flow or particular uh, uh, time frame that helps to reduce flow. So the goal in this is, again, to be able to ensure that you're not overworking the people that have to be able to, to do something because ultimately they won't be able to keep up. Now, there's another component of this when we talk about that flow aspect of it. And that's where the last thing we want to do is to be able to or is to allow the, um, uh, the passing by of an issue. Right. So most organizations, you know, it's like, well, that's not my my org. I'm not responsible for that. Um, somebody else will catch it down the stream. Well, what we find is that if you do that, the amount of money and time and effort it takes to be able to fix a problem go up exponentially. So within um, this process, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're swarming on problems, that we're stopping uh, you know, uh, work when we detect that there's a problem, if it's necessary. Now, there may be situations where it's not, but we want to make sure that it doesn't just get kicked down the road, right? Because nobody wants to watch that movie again. Nobody wants to see the effects of with, you know, the, 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 the ramifications of, man, I really wish I would have fixed it early because now it's like 10 times the work and I'm, I'm never going to take a uh, vacation again. So that's the thing we're trying to fix with this. And then in addition from a flow and systems perspective, it's to comp constantly optimize this for the business goals. And the business goals have to be defined. And just like with any project that you're involved on, if you don't have a good use case and you don't have good business goals and you don't have metrics to be able to measure the success or failure of your project, you will not get funding, right? So that's ultimately why it's so important to do this. All right, so let's talk about the second way. The second way is to be able to have a feedback loop. This is where you get the ability to amplify feedback to prevent problems from happening again. So it's similar to what we were talking about before of not passing things downstream, but it takes it a step further. So the, the idea behind this is we want to identify these issues and we want to find them and document them. But more importantly, we want to make sure that they're put on the, the, uh, uh, you know, the planning process to get them fixed as quickly as possible. Because if you continue to allow a problem to occur over and over again, it's wasteful and it's, it's really a sign of poor, uh, poor management. Right. So, again, make sure that the feedback loop is amplified so that problems that are identified by those working in the trenches, because they've got the context, they know what's happening at the at that level. Make sure that that's amplified up. And it's it's important for for management and leadership to make sure that that uh, that's a, a focus to get fixed. The other thing is to be able to create a faster detection and recovery mechanism. And that's where a lot of technology can come into play. The goal is to see problems as they occur and then, of course, swarm them until fixed, just like we were talking about in the other way. Um, and then, of course, the last thing is maximizing opportunities to learn and improve, to be able to look for ways to be able to reward people for improvements to a system, for simplification of a system. That should be an area where you should invest in um, as a business to be able to uh, reward people that are thinking efficiency because, you know, ultimately that's, that's how you get away from having these hugely overly complex 
heavy technical debt projects that, that just go on forever and spend a ton of money. All right, the last one is the concept of continuous experimentation and learning. One thing you'll find with DevOps and DevSecOps is the fact that you have to continually experiment and you have to look for new ways of solving problems. Now, this is something that requires a lot of iteration or continuing to go um, over some of these different processes. You'll find that as technology increases, as new, new frameworks come out, as new programming methodologies, new application structures come out, you're going to constantly have to be looking for ways to be able to um, secure that environment as well as to be able to operationalize it. So having a fixed or even a group that, that just works on innovation can be a very good way to continue this process. But the purpose of this is to make sure you have a dynamic and disciplined culture of experimentation and risk-taking. Not that we're going to bet the whole farm right on a, a particular project, but we're going to constantly experiment and try things. Because if there's a failure, that failure is not really a failure. What it is is it's an opportunity to learn. And I think that having a culture like that is where I've seen the most success with customers that I've worked with is they're hungry and they incentivize their, um, their organization to be able to take risks and try new things. Because at one point, you may catch lightning in a bottle. And the more times that you, you know, sort of get a, a, a ticket for that, uh, that lottery is, is more likelihood of you actually getting that success or being able to capture that lightning in a bottle. So it's, it's really an important aspect of it. In addition, we want to make sure that we set aside time to be able to fix issues and make the system better. You know, there's, there's, it's great to be able to document things and uh, document a problem, but if nobody's actually working on fixing it or there's not enough time or it's not built into the schedule, nothing's going to get done. So the goal here is to make sure that everything is, uh, that, you know, uh, that issues are identified, that there's time on the schedule to be able to fix things and that this information doesn't just get put into some folder somewhere on your laptop, never to be seen again. And of course, when things go wrong, you can't be in a, in a toxic culture where everybody starts pointing fingers. If that's going to go on, then ultimately you're not going to succeed. That's a culture problem because DevOps is about trying new things fast, failing fast, and then being able to pivot and move on to something new. And then last thing here is just really the ability to be able to share information. So open source has been magical when we think of the industry. Open source is a great way for people to be able to work together to solve a similar problem, to be able to use the, you know, the natural ability for multiple, um, you know, multiple you know, brains and eyes to be able to fix things faster, as well as to be able to innovate and try new things. So within your organization, create shared code repositories. As we start talking about ways in which DevSecOps operates, you're going to find that you know, many of these, these different approaches are going to require that you think like a software developer. developer. Um, if you're not already a software developer, but if you're working on the infrastructure and the operational side, you've got to start operating that way. And that means creating shared code repositories, infrastructure as code, shared automation scripts, Terraform scripts, all these different things that you're using to automate your environment. Make sure you share it and get other people involved because you'll be amazed at how much better your environment will operate the more eyes and brains you get working on it. All right, so that is in a nutshell sort of what the DevOps aspects of it are. And I think it's important that we started there because it gives us context for moving forward. So fantastic. We've been talking about DevOps. What about security? Well, so when we think about the dev and the ops side of it, there's not really a whole lot of mention of security when you look at DevOps. Now, for me, since I'm a security practitioner, I immediately start thinking about security no matter what I'm talking about. So ultimately, it's a, it's a mind shift that has to occur within our development organizations as well as our operations teams so that security is not looked at as just some separate entity. And if you look at some of the tools that we have, things like configuration management tools, the ability to be able to standardize on certain ways in which we deploy applications, security can be baked into there because we can make sure that we follow certain rules and standards and things like that. But ultimately, it can't be something that is just a separate process. You can't bolt it onto DevOps. It's not going to allow you to be able to be successful that way. So in order to be able to put security in the mix, that's where DevSecOps came into play. You're hearing a lot more about it today. Why? Because it is a crucial aspect of making sure that applications that are deployed in a rapid manner are deployed in a secure manner. And without that, 
we're going to end up with more and more vulnerabilities, more and more issues that we have to deal with, especially as complex as the software development environment uh, world is, as well as all the different components and modules we use as we build software. So that's the goal behind DevSecOps. Now, if we look at some of the benefits, this is where it gets interesting. Some of the benefits that you're often going to see are the fact that you can have really rapid, cost-effective software delivery. That's something that, that uh, DevOps provides to you, but from a DevSecOps perspective, you don't have that delay in having a separate organization, per se, coming in and assessing things and then giving you reports. It's all built into the process. That means you can move a lot faster because you can automate and drive some of these techniques you were doing in DevOps with security at the same time. It also allows you to be able to be uh, to have improved proactive security as opposed to after the fact security. If you think about it, most security organizations they go and they pen test. Now, the ability to use automation, we've talked a little bit about that, but it's it's very compatible with modern development practices that use uh, pipelines to be able to develop software. Because remember, so many of these tools are going to be able to be scripted. They're able to be um, operated in an automated fashion. So bolting them into the, uh, the, the pipeline at various stages gives you the ability to do these kind of tests and assessments uh, during the build process so that everything is done, you know, for the most part in an automated fashion. And then, of course, you have the ability to be able to have your professionals, your security focused individuals, be able to tie into the areas they need to be most uh, interested in and, and uh, they can focus their time on. But ultimately, the best value of this from a benefits perspective is that you can have a repeatable and adaptable process because ultimately it's going to change a lot. You'll have new software coming out, new ways of developing software. But the goal is if you build a framework that makes this happen uh, automatically, you can make those changes and adjust the pipeline to be able to adapt to it. So it's really a great thing to do when it comes down to, uh, you know, the, the benefits are, are you know, fairly tangible uh, from a monetary perspective for a business, but also from a speed and agility perspective. Now, the DevSecOps manifesto is, is interesting. There, there's a lot of these different manifestos. There was an agile one. There's, you know, various ones out there. Um, I think they're a little, you know, they're, they're, some of them are kind of obvious, but I like the DevSecOps manifesto because it does talk about what they focus on, right? And this is, again, is another way of being able to think, how am I going to change not only the culture, but my operational model. So leaning in over always saying no, right? How many of you have the security department being the department of no, right? Everything is going to be a, 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 you know, a hurdle you have to jump over. It's bureaucratic. It's very, very difficult. So the idea of DevSecOps is we're going to lean in as a security organization as opposed to, you know, being, being ones that you have to come to and, and uh, you know, convince to be able to do what you need to do. Um, data and security uh, science over fear, uncertainty, and doubt, where we actually use tangible uh, threat models. We use tangible research and, and uh, threat intelligence, where we're actually using the ability for us to understand our applications in a deep way so that we can see anomalies. So instead of being worried about it and thinking, oh, tomorrow, who knows what I'm going to run into, you've got a little bit more confidence because you've got the visibility into your applications. Um, security services with APIs. Being able to use that versus mandated security controls and, and paperwork. Oh, so much paperwork in, in uh, security today. But being able to leverage these, a these APIs and automate them, it allows us to be able to get away from that and move a lot faster. You know, so, so as we start to look at all these, again, they give you some ideas of where you want to focus on. And most of this is going to leverage the benefit of automation as well as the capabilities of leveraging the ability to, to sort of drive this as, as a machine when you think of um, how applications are deployed from a security perspective. All right, so the DevSecOps culture challenge. Now, I think I've beat this one as, as probably as hard as, as, as I can get to, but I think it's also important to understand the different groups of people that you're dealing with. So depending upon where you come from, if you come from the app side, you're going you know, to probably uh, lean more towards the developer view of things. If you're on the operation side, you're going to lead, lean towards uh, more of that. And then on the security side, obviously, you're going to be thinking about it from the, per secu per uh, the security perspective. But the way that the different groups see it is very important because that's ultimately how you get culture together. That's how you get the organization to align. So the operations world, you got to understand what do they care about? They, number one, care that everything is stable. There are standards in place, templates are being followed, and they're not getting bothered at 2 a.m., or when they've got a hot yoga class in the afternoon, right? 
success is really defined by are, is the software stable, do backups and restore works, and are all of the systems operating within a defined threshold? Now, if we look at the way developers operate and what they care about, their key thing is obviously writing software. They want working code. They want to know what APIs they have access to. They want to know what libraries they can use to be able to simplify their build. And they want to be able to be successful in finishing their sprints if they're following an agile methodology. So their idea of success, software works, laptop and test, right? So they're able to test the software. They get it to successfully build. And then ultimately they finish their sprints on time and they're able to, to move on to the next thing. And then of course, security, how do we look at security? What do they care about? Well, they care about policies, regulations, patching and vulnerability management, closing cases, and not getting owned, right? But the rest of the world looks at security as this gate that I have to go around, right? So ultimately, it, it becomes a bit of a challenge when we think of how security can be successful because they really are looked at as the department of no in a lot of cases. Now, success for security, they can pass audits. They can manage risks successfully as close as possible. Risk will never be zero. It will never be zero. But you've got to manage it to something that you can, that you can uh, live with. And then ultimately, they've got a lower ticket count. If they can reduce the number of tickets, the number of things that they have to address from an uh, operational perspective, the security group is very happy. So looking at this, we can see that there's a lot of things that we have to bring together with DevSecOps. And I think it's important to think about this, at least from a high-level perspective, and understand that the big thing that we're trying to solve for is this ability to be able to move fast, right, which is represented by the, the left-hand view of change, and the ability to be able to keep things stable and operational, which is, which is identified by the right side. And the big difference between this, if we look at sprints, sprints typically will happen every two weeks, might be three, might be four, depends on your organization, but every couple of weeks, you're going to have a new version of software, so on the left, you're seeing a lot of change and manipulation of the code and a lot of things that need to be uh, dealt with. Whereas on the right-hand side, this is a change window process every six months. So if I'm going to make changes to the infrastructure and I'm, I lock it down every six months, what happens during each one of those changes is they're monumental. It's like the, the operations people have software just raining down on their heads. So ultimately, I need to get this together in a secure way. Right. So being able to do uh, to address this is ultimately the challenge we have with DevSecOps, because ultimately, if we look at the, the, the approaches we take today, traditional IT service delivery is very slow. There's way too much manual work and it is error prone. Why? Because it follows a very rigid, structured environment. So by moving to something like DevSecOps, we get the ability to be able to run in parallel. We can automate. And we can remove sort of that manual aspect of it where, you know, we know that the minute we get human beings involved in doing something manual, you open up a lot more risk and a lot more chance of error. Now, the culture in DevSecOps is, is interesting because this is going to show you sort of what you need to address as you're starting to deploy this out. Now, if we, if we look at this, this uh, view on the right, I like this because it really shows, about, shows you the key things that you need to address from an operational perspective. Number one, you obviously have to address the, the, the technology. Then you have to also make sure that in the same time, you're getting the people comfortable and, and being able to operate in different ways. You've got your governance standards in place so the groups aren't doing their own thing, but we're following a standards, uh, standard group. And then the processes are going to be something that are, that are uh, documented as well as way la uh, well laid out. And this requires that you have training first and foremost. So as you look at ways to be able to deploy things like DevOps or DevSecOps in, a, in an organization, training is one of the most important things. And from a security perspective, training is crucial for everybody in your organization, but especially within your developers, right? And especially within your operations folks. If they're not thinking about security, you can't just rely on the security group to be able to discover it, right? That's not how, that's not, that's not the most effective way of doing it. So creating security champions in each of these groups is crucial. And that's where you get people that are interested in this and they can, you know, get some knowledge and get some training on it. And they can be sort of an ambassador for security within all the different groups that are doing these efforts. And of course, as we mentioned before, you can't be the department of no from a security perspective. The goal is to create a culture of trust. And if you create a, crust, a, a, a culture of trust, then you have the ability to be able to work together as a group towards a common goal. 
And trust ultimately comes into play when you all have that shared fate environment. So none of these groups would be successful if the, if, you know, in, until the actual software is deployed in a secure way in the organization. All right, looks like there's a couple of questions out there in the Q&A. Oh, actually, just a comment. Uh, so all three of the books that I talked about are available in the O'Reilly Library app.